So I guess uh, my presentation is somewhat similar to Heather's because it's it's focusing around oh and Nathaniel's because it's it's focusing around how ORCIDs primarily facilitate publications collection in the context of collecting publications not only for her to see but um, as Heather's indicated increasingly it's about universities being able to effectively represent online presence of their researchers and and you know comprehensive representations of everything that they do. So I want to put this in the context of, I want to put ORCID in the context of how we've gone about collecting publications over the last 14 years or so and um, in 2001, um, almost all the way through the, uh, to 2008, it really was a, a, a manual exercise of, you know, keying in publications. Along the way, it's become more of a, um, uh, an enterprise in, in harvesting publications from Scopus and Web of Science to the point now where we're really sort of, and the, the point where, where ORCID's evolved into it is, is now um, not just harvesting publications, but how do we refine the, the, the publications that we can harvest so that we can limit the noise that we get, which is, it's, so that's pretty much the trajectory that I want to talk about. So from an Australian perspective, this is, uh, I guess, fairly obvious, but it's worth pointing out that publication collection is a multi-million dollar enterprise. This graph that you see on the screen is basically all of the publications that we've collected by department uh, for all of the departments in the University of Melbourne. The different colours are the different types of publications, so that sort of purpley colour are journal articles, the, the light bluish colour that you can see in the, the graph sort of four to, across the top are a, um, conference papers. You can see there's a, um, about Halfway down, there's a chart that looks nothing like the other ones. That's the VCA and Performing Arts, so they're doing lots of different sorts of publications. Uh, the purpley colour in the bottom are books and book chapters. So you can see, you know, over over 14 years, we've collected you know over 150,000 data points of, of publications. Each of those data points took you know at least 15 minutes to to enter. Um, involved reviewing it by by multiple different people. The, the amount of time that it takes to do all those things quickly quickly adds up. So the context in which ORCID and which uh, reducing the amount of work it takes to collect these things is really quite a serious enterprise. So I've talked about, uh, st started to already talk about the, the, the evolution of how, of how we collect the data. Probably up, for the University of Melbourne, probably up until about 2009, the only way we collected that data was through manual entry. So either it was researchers keying in their publications or publications coordinators on their behalf. Probably we came quite late to this, but we got wise that we could harvest publications from a source like Web of Science or Scopus and then, you know, refine them and process them. And um, we started doing that with just Web of Science in 2010. We got to the end of that process and I quickly realised that whilst it was effective doing it for Web of Science, we then had to turn around and do it for Scopus and then we'd have to turn around and do it for Repec. Uh, then we'd have to do it for Archive and PubMed and every other source that came on and which was really unsustainable. So we, um, about 2012, we implemented Symplectic, which enabled us to harvest from multiple sources um, and basically help us build combined records. So we have a publication record that can say, here's the publication, here's the publication representation of that in Web of Science and Scopus and, and so on. So over time, uh, Publications and interaction has moved from data entry or emailing your publications coordinator to we think we found these publications. Can you please confirm whether we've got it right? So uh, this is a screenshot from our UAT instance of, of Symplectic, and you can see that if Jim McCluskey were to log in, he'd see that he has 32 journal articles that he needs to uh, uh, claim, and he gets a screen somewhat like this. So he can quickly go down and tick yes, this is mine. No, that's not. So that works well, uh, provided we don't offer up Jim or other researchers too many false positives. So we don't want to create a situation where a researcher has to wade through, you know, hundreds of publications uh, to find the ten that, that, that are actually the, actually theirs. So the way Symplectic works for those is that what uh, what you do is you go in and you say, okay, for this researcher, these are their search terms and these are their organisation affiliations, and it goes off and searches each of the each of the each of the interfaces to try and find publications that match match those search terms. So obviously, 
how good you get, how well you retune those, those search terms determines how many false positives come up. Because we've been collecting publications for uh, 14 years and because we've had symplectic running in the background uh, for a number of years, we, we know which publications uh, belong to our researchers for the, for the previous 10, 14 years and, and, their, and their equivalent Web of Science record or and, and their equivalent Scopus record. Because we know that, we can query those records to find out the actual author search terms that they used on those records and the actual organisational affiliations that they used. So before we roll out uh, Symplectic to our researchers, we can pre-populate all, all of those search terms in that record. And that's helped us to reduce the amount of false positives uh, for some researchers. Probably about for an 80% of the researchers, we were able to, by uh, pursuing this strategy, we were able to reduce the amount of false positives that, that uh, appeared for researchers for some people. So you'll see along the x-axis, you'll see people who used to have a lot of uh, publications pending, so for approval. There's a data point at you know, 1500 that's been reserved to zero. But on the other side, you'll see people who used to have fewer publications pending in Symplectic and now have lots of publications. And basically, this is because configuring search terms for researchers can only take you so far, because some people have such common names and that no matter how far you configure the search terms, there really just isn't a way of providing searches that just bring up their, their, research, their search results. And to give you an indication of who they are, if we look at the top 20 or so researchers uh, who uh, are getting lots and lots of false positives, we can see that predominantly they're um, Asian surnames of, of some sort. And, and really there is no there is no approach or help help for these people in terms of configuring search terms. Some researchers just need ORCIDs. So as part of phase two of our symplectic rollout, we'll be targeting these researchers uh, for ORCID IDs first because it's these researchers for whom having an ORCID ID can help the most. And our strategy for doing that will be again to use symplectic and to use symplectic to go in, get a researcher to go in and configure their ORCID through this sort of interface. So that's, that's one use of ORCIDs for our researchers, but the real reason we started getting interesting in ORCIDs was not for our researchers, but it was actually for our graduate students. Because with our graduate students, we've got a problem of trying to work out what happens to, uh, or what graduate students have done after they leave the university. So after they've left the university, we've got no recourse to say, hey, we think you've done this publication, could you please confirm it? Um, so we need to know, you know, what have they published based on the research that they conducted before they left? Uh, can we claim that in Herd C? And we also really want to know where have they gone? What, you know, what does their academic career look like three years after they left the university, for instance? So for these reasons, we've now got a university policy which requires graduate students to have an ORCID, and we will be managing this process through Symplectic. So our idea is to encourage uh, graduate students to have ORCIDs, but not just have ORCIDs, but actually use that ORCID as an active part of their research career. So it's not just having one, but it's actually owning it and ensuring that all of their outputs are going to be connected up to it. So really, once we've done that, uh, we've got a mechanism to glue our, our knowledge about who our graduate students were to an evolving data set of what they're doing in the open world. Our approach for graduate students, unlike some other ORCID implementations for graduate students, we won't be minting ORCIDs for our researchers. Uh, the reason for that is we feel that Although there, there are methods where you can uh, create ORCIDs on behalf of your graduate students for all of your, all of your researchers, the risk is that you end up with ORCIDs that have been created for, research, for graduate students which they don't own. So you think you've created an ORCID for them, but basically they've just ignored the email that came through from ORCID once it's been created. There's an ORCID out there for them, but the first time they go to use an ORCID, they'll just create a new one because they've completely forgotten that that process has happened. So the risk of creating unknown ORCIDs is too high for us to consider minting them for our graduate students. We will be emailing our graduate students just like ORCID does, but we will be asking them to go into Symplectic and attach their and configure their ORCID in their Symplectic account. The process within Symplectic is quite straightforward for this. If users don't have an ORCID, uh, they can get one as part of the process of configuring their ORCID in Symplectic. And basically it's maybe one or two clicks more than doing it through a minting process. But the end result is we now have 
if we can get students to do that, we now have a process where we can track those students that have ORCIDs in our system, and we can also, and we also know that those students have actually undergone some activity which indicates that they might have a better chance of owning that ORCID. And we've got a, now got a, a solid practice to track those who haven't engaged with the system with follow-up emails. So we can really track our success of how that, how that flows. That's really the, the, the ORCID story. And I guess reflections on the trajectory of this, we've talked about moving from data entry to data glue, and we've talked about how we harvest publications, how we need to use ORCIDs to glue our knowledge of uh, graduate students to uh, evolving information in the world about them. But I guess the reflection is that it's not just publications that we want to glue back to our data sets. Increasingly, it's grants, um, uh, not only because we've now got NHMRC requirements to, that want to track the publications that belong to those grants and ensure that we've got open access publications for them. Um, it's also research data. It's also potentially um, uh, academic history for researchers. And we really feel that ORCID's a key piece of the puzzle to help us do this in the future. So we were asked also to reflect on the ORCID workshop. And I guess the biggest takeaway I had from the ORCID workshop is that there are multiple levels of um, ORCID subscription. You can subscribe um, as an institution at various different levels. And you can also subscribe as a nation, which offers um, uh, discounts. And I, I, I got the sense from, from the room that one of the things that we might we should uh, ask a call about is whether we can pursue a national subscription through the through the call membership. So that's just my final thought.